Welcome to Ella's Beef Easter's Radio Air Check and Classic TV Channel. The tea can take you where you're going. Take the tea to where you've never been. They've been around this town, so they know it up and down. For years they served your family and your kin. The trains are getting newer and some fares are going down. We're trying to make it easier to get around your town. It won't happen overnight, but someday we'll be out of sight. Face it, folks, the answer is the T. The T has all the energy you need to get where you're going. So save your gasoline and get in and around town the quick, inexpensive way. You'll be doing a good turn for your environment as well as yourself. When it comes to getting around, the T is your answer. T can take you where you go. Harold Wilson is the new Prime Minister of Great Britain tonight. Labourite Wilson got the job when Conservative Party leader Edward Heath resigned this morning. Heath said he quit because he was unable to form a new coalition minority cabinet in weekend talks with Jeremy Thorpe, the leader of the third party Liberals. As soon as Queen Elizabeth appointed Wilson, he set to work forming the new government. WBZ's Ed Fontaine reports from London. The new British Prime Minister, Harold Wilson, set to work tonight to prepare his new cabinet list saying that there is work to do, and he's starting right now in the interest of a unified nation. Mr. Wilson returned from his audience with Queen Elizabeth II after Edward Heath submitted his resignation following his inability to create a coalition with the Liberal Party. It's not certain whether that coalition would have been strong enough to maintain a government anyway, but the Liberals turned it down, advocating a national unity government of all main parties. Former Prime Minister Edward Heath supported that idea in principle and promised that his opposition would not be based on the negative premise of removing the Labour government from power. However, the Labour leaders who have spoken on radio and television have emphasized that the Labour government will submit its proposals and leave it up to the other parties to decide when to make their opposition total. Ed DeFontaine, Group W News, London. Well, yesterday, Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir said she was quitting. However, today she did an about-face and said she'd stay on the job for at least the next two days. Mrs. Meir said she'd continue to work to form a new minority cabinet. Her failure to come up with the new government was the reason for her resignation. The political crisis in Israel has formed fears that the U.S. State Department, the upcoming troop disengagement talks with Syria to be held in Washington, may be in danger. And federal judge John Sirica today ordered a hearing for Wednesday into that secret report given him by the Watergate grand jury. The judge wants to hear from all sides, including the White House, about what should be done with the report. Right now, here's the mild weather forecast for Boston and vicinity. Tonight, cloudy and mild, chance of a few showers, low temperatures in the 50s. Then on Tuesday, cloudy with scattered showers likely during the morning, becoming partly sunny by late in the day. Continued quite warm, high temperatures in the mid to upper 60s. Then Tuesday night, fair, low temperatures in the 40s. Looking ahead to Wednesday, mostly sunny and mild weather forecast once again. Not quite as warm, high temperatures in the 50s. The WBZ temperature now at 56. Repeating this hour's top story, inform sources at the State Department tonight say the Arab oil embargo against the United States will end next week. And that's the 11 o'clock WBZ report with portions recorded. I'm Ted Larson, WBZ News. Reminding you, if you don't have a BZ ALA questionnaire yet, it's easy to get one. Just send a self-addressed stamped envelope to Commuter Computer, Box 103, Boston 02134. WBZ editorials have advocated public financing of election campaigns and urged people to use the Presidential Fund checkoff box for their 1973 federal tax forms. Here with the rebuttal is Steve Nelson of Cambridge. Beware. There's a trap in your federal income tax return. It's the Presidential Election Campaign Fund checkoff box. Now, I couldn't agree more that our election financing procedures badly need an overhaul, but this scheme is not the answer. First, it's a free ride for politicians, a means for them to siphon off your tax dollars under the cover of law. Second, it doesn't cover primary elections. So all a candidate has to do is win the primary by whatever corrupt means necessary and then coast through the general election on the public dole. Third, it subverts the Constitution. Elections were instituted as a means by which we the people can control our government. To give that government this control over the election purse is ultimately to give the government control over elections and over us. 
we can eliminate corruption without surrendering the independence of the ballot. Congress should impose a maximum on contributions and require in all federal elections, primary and general, that all contributions be made to a public account administered by the Treasury. All expenditures must be drawn from that account, and it would be a felony to make or receive a contribution or to purchase or sell campaign services other than through this account. Printouts of all campaign contributions and expenditures over $25 would be made public on a weekly basis. The tax dollar is already under too much pressure, even without the campaign fund checkoff scheme. So steer clear of the checkoff box. There's a wolf inside, ready to ravage your rights and swallow your taxes. Let's demand genuine election reform, not election giveaways. WBZ has presented rebuttal with Steve Nelson of Cambridge. He was replying to our editorial urging people to use the Presidential Campaign Fund checkoff on 1973 tax returns. Eight and a half after 11 now on BZ Radio. Once again, we go back to Jerry Williams. Seven, eight. Hello, America. Welcome back. This is Jerry Williams here on WBZ, the spirit of 103, in case you tuned in a bit late. Father John McLaughlin, Dr. McLaughlin, Deputy Special Assistant to the President, is here. Worked for the President for almost three years now as an advisor, fact finder, presidential spokesman, and previously as a speechwriter. He's here uh, discussing the presidency, the Watergate matters, the impeachment or whatever. We're at 2545678. The area code is 617, and uh, uh, Dr. McLaughlin wanted to continue answering the last gentleman who was on the air. The, uh, the last gentleman on the air, the man who had been uh, 12 years in broadcasting, uh, raised uh, two points that um, I really didn't get to, and one was uh, concerned with the, the Cox dismissal. The, the president discharged Archibald Cox because he rejected a compromise, the Stennis Compromise, which provided that Senator Stennis would review the tapes and uh, make uh, transcripts available uh, to appropriate authorities. Uh, the president saw this as an equitable resolution of an extremely complex matter involving the separation of powers, which he is constitutionally mandated and under oath obliged to preserve. And at the same time, um, he had to respect the rights of the duly constituted authorities to investigate any possibility of wrongdoing on the part of administration spokesmen, administration personnel. And, and therefore, he, he worked out this compromise. It was rejected by Mr. Cox in a uh, dramatic public way, and this is what induced the president to take the action that he, that he took. Um, I don't think that that can be cited as an immoral act on the president's part. It is true that he said he would refrain from interfering with Mr. Cox's operation, but surely that cannot be interpreted in an absolute sense. One cannot, when one makes statements of that nature, envision every contingency that could arise. Who would have foreseen that Archie Cox would have gone on national television and have said what he did say, thus really provoking a, um, uh, or at least adding to the provocation um, that led to his discharge. With regard to the uh, tapes and the availability of the tapes, um, the president made these available at as early as he could, consistent with his obligation to preserve the separation of powers. He had resisted making the tapes available for several reasons. One, the tapes were recorded under circumstances in which the in individuals being taped, by and large, did not know that this was occurring. This imposes ethical obligations to keep the conversations, therefore, uh, private and fully confidential. Secondly, he uh, here uh, was trying to protect the separation of powers again. And I might uh, repeat what, what Andrew Jackson said when a congressional committee demanded information from him. 
For myself, Andrew Jackson said, President Jackson said, I shall repel all such attempts as an invasion of the principles of justice as well as of the Constitution, and I shall esteem it my sacred duty to the people of the United States to resist them as I would, establish, as I would the establishment of a Spanish Inquisition. I submit to you that this president has been far more forthcoming than is indicated in this statement by President Andrew Jackson. All right, our next call for Father McLaughlin. Hello. Hello, Jerry. Yes. Jerry, I'd like to talk to uh, Dr. McLaughlin. Yes, I am here. Dr. McLaughlin, uh, I wish to commend you and cite you as an articulate defender of what I believe you believe in. Uh, you have done an excellent job of representing a cause in which I do not personally believe, but I think you have done your very best to represent it fairly and honestly. Many people have attacked you this evening because they find uh, some contradiction in the actions of a priest uh, functioning as a government agent or instrumentality. I say I am grateful to the powers of heaven that I find a man with moral training and moral background in a high office or at least an advisory office in government today. I think that we certainly need people who have a moral background. However, I would like to point out to you that there appears to be a serious breach in your argument. Back in the interval between 8 and 9 o'clock when Jerry read the transcript of a, a reprint of an article from an obscure newspaper in Pennsylvania printed in the New York Times, you cited in defense of the administration's position a litany of transgressions that went back, I believe, to Woodrow Wilson. You definitely cited Franklin Delano Roosevelt. You also cited the emotionally involved President Kennedy. You cited uh, Lyndon Johnson as all capable of being impeached for various breaches and transgressions, various broadening of their power or encroachment upon the congressional powers. And I believe if I read you correctly or heard you properly, you said that if this is the standard by which an American president is to be tried by the Congress, then we will have a, a president who is... Uh, so devoid of power and devoid of conviction and the power to act that the office of the presidency will be essentially worthless. Did I read you correct in your summary, or at least in my paraphrasing of your summary? Yes, what I was saying is if you accept the definition of an impeachable offense as maladministration or presidential abuse of power, then you throw the net so wide that you would entrap Many of these earlier, all of these earlier presidents, with the exception of Benjamin Harrison, uh, William H. Uh, William Harrison, who was only in for 31 days, that they have all done something which could be interpreted by a political adversary as being uh, maladministration. All right. Now, if we can carry that one step further, because I think in very simple terms, and many of my friends think in simple terms. If a man in public office does something that is an act of maladministration, he has performed an evil action. Now, you cited all of these historical precedents, and in my mind, you have cited them potentially as evil actions. Now, is it your position that the present administration is defensible because it does not uh, embrace greater evil than, let us say, for the sake of argument, past administrations that had inherent acts of evil involved in their history or in their administration of the office. Well, let me point out that the acts that I cited, and that article is by, by William White, for example, the Louisiana Purchase, I don't think was an evil act, but I do think that a political adversary who maintained that maladministration was an impeachable offense could say he didn't have the clearance to negotiate the Louisiana Purchase from from Congress, therefore he was overstepping his presidential bounds, therefore he was guilty of an abuse of presidential power, therefore he should be impeached. You could take uh, Patsy Mink's uh, charge that the president should be impeached because he dismantled the office of OEO. You could, you could, uh, you could contend that this was a, an abuse of presidential power or dereliction of presidential duty, and so the president should be impeached. Or you could take Rodney Stark's charge, the congressman from California, that the president ought to be impeached because he was over-emphatic in his defenses of B.B. Rebozo, in his public defense of Rebozo. You, clearly, I think most of us would say that that is nonsense, but 
if a person chooses to contend that and introduce a bill in the in the Congress, then this uh, then this would lead ultimately to an enfeeblement of the presidential office, and it would uh, hopelessly politicize this particular impeachment hearing. I, I Therefore, see. just just one more sentence. Therefore, I maintain that criminality must be ingredient to the definition of an impeachable offense. Otherwise, the politicization of this ins issue will be uh, hopelessly uh, extended. I concede uh, that uh, when you get to spurious issues, uh, issues of uh, whether the president is entitled to appear in a public office wearing a crew cut or the, whether he uh, has breached his uh, office uh, and the propriety of his office if he shows up in a bow tie versus a straight tie, uh, these are spurious. Uh, whether he defends his personal friends or whether he lets his personal friends stand in the limelight of uh, public attack, these are spurious issues. But when uh, there appears to be substantive grounds uh, in the minds of the American electorate and substantive grounds in the minds of re elected representatives of the American people for alleging that the office of the president has encroached upon its constitutional parameters, then there is the necessity, the moral necessity, to confront these issues in a process of law. And I cannot conceive of anyone with your training, doctor, suggesting that the entire thing be swept under the table under the guise of enfeeblement of the office. In fact, I dare say the American public today is a vastly more courageous public than the public that was confronted by the fireside chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and by the, uh, the flaming rhetoric of John F. Kennedy and by the Western uh, sanguinity of uh, Lyndon Johnson, today's electorate is brave enough to endure this moral test of the office of presidency and let the chips fall where they may. This is the essential difference in 1970 as opposed to 1930. And the essential difference has largely been brought home to the American electorate by means of the mass media. Every man in the street makes up his own mind today, and I feel that there is, within the American people, the temper, the fortitude to bear this trial fairly and honestly by legitimate principles of law and let the chips fall where they may. Yes, I do not wish to see any man become a martyr to what you call the monopoly interest to impeach, to remove the man from office. Yeah, I, but must, uh... I feel there is a compelling moral necessity to pursue this matter to its ultimate end and let the let history be the ultimate judge. All right, sir, I'm going to let Father McLaughlin answer that in a couple of minutes. Of unless I do these things properly now, I won't be able to finish the program on time. All right? Right, Jerry. Thank you very much, and we'll get a, uh, another word from uh, Dr. McLaughlin on this. Today, there are thousands of people who think they're suffering from difficulties requiring psychiatric care, and their problem may not be emotional at all. It may just be an allergy problem, an allergy to common food additives or everyday pain relievers. That's the startling word from Prevention, America's largest health magazine. Although millions are getting much-needed help from psychiatric care, Prevention's March issue tells fascinating case histories of how doctors relieved anxiety, asthma, and other emotional problems simply by identifying unsuspected allergies in the patient. This is the kind of advanced news from the frontiers of science that one million Prevention subscribers get monthly. Plus recipes, beauty hints, vital facts about nutrition. Try 12 issues of Prevention for only $3.85. We'll send you two free, a remarkable 32-page report called Live It Up, Live Longer. If you don't like the first issue of Prevention, cancel, keep the first issue, keep the special report. You owe nothing. But send no money now. Just write Prevention, WBZ Boston 02134. Prevention, WBZ Boston 02134. Get glasses that make you happy. We've got it all waiting for you. Put on a happy face at your vision center. Well, here are some facts you ought to know if you wear or buy glasses. Pearl Vision Center provides complete one-stop, one-hour service for most glasses. They have the greatest selection of frames and lenses you've ever seen. And they are the only people who offer you the great eyeglass guarantee. If you break your glasses, we fix or replace them unconditionally for one whole year. Pearl Vision Center, close to Boston, in the Methuen Mall, Worcester Center, Hampshire Plaza, in Manchester. Glasses that make you happy, we've got it all waiting for you. Put on a happy face at your vision center. Pearl 
Vision Center in the Methuen Mall open weekdays 10 to 9, Saturdays till 5. Watch for their grand opening in downtown Boston. While Boston sleeps, around the world, news is made. And in the morning, every morning, Gary LaPierre and the BZ News team have the news you need to know. If you're thinking about skiing the Alps, you should know that right now, Italy's Alps are just about the best value around. Because now through March 31st, Alitalia is reducing prices on many ski packages to the Italian Alps. Now you can spend a week there for as little as $373, including your airfare, hotel, and a lot more. And you'll get more out of skiing Italy's Alps because Italy's got more Alps to ski. More than France, Austria, and Switzerland combined. More long ski runs, more sun, and a fantastic variety of resorts. And you'll not only have the Alps to ski, you'll have a lot of temptations not to. You can swim in our heated pools, dance in our discotheques, and feast on great Italian food and wine. For a free brochure, call your travel agent or Alitalia. And call now, while our ski tours cost less and your dollar buys more. Rates from Boston are $373 to $572 per person, seven or eight day GIT economy class airfare, depending on accommodations and meal plan, subject to change. Let's hear it, let's hear it, let's hear it for the little guy. That little guy is the little colonial guy on the label of Colonial Franks. And wherever you find the little guy, you found Franks that are the best. Maybe just a little bit better, but the best. The best because they're prepared in our bright, clean new sausage kitchen. Or the best because we've got our own subtle blend of meat and spices. Or the best because we've got a special way to see that every Colonial Frank tastes as consistently perfect and good as the first. Whether it's our beef Franks, our tasty 10 and other mild Franks, Texas wieners or knockwurst. The little guy stands for the best Franks at the fairest possible price from Colonial. Let's hear it. Did you want to uh, respond to that uh, question? Yes. I don't think that I'm in a p position of disagreement with the caller. The caller wants a process of law to operate on this impeachment qu question. And he believes in a compelling moral necessity for a process of law to operate on the question and to see it to its termination. I couldn't agree with that more emphatically. The point at issue uh, in the earlier part of the conversation with the caller was whether or not criminality or an indictable offense is the definition of an impeachable offense. My feeling is that it, that it is, and if indeed, if it is regarded as such by the Rodino Committee, the Rodino Committee will vote out a no impeachment resolution. Uh, I do not want in any way the process of law to be inhibited. But what I do want is a process of law, not a process of politics take place. What I'm afraid of is that what is transpiring now is excessively political in nature and not legal or juridical in nature. Uh, with regard to the sentiment of the American people, which the caller had reference to, I note that the recent, most recent poll indicates that 62.4% of the American people do not wish the president to resign, and 70% of the American people do not wish the president to be impeached, which means indicted. Uh, I note that uh, the, the, just the recent news item, too, that the, there is a clear probability that the Arab embargo would, will be lifted within a week and that the price of uh, oil will drop from $11 a barrel to $7 a barrel indicates to me that the president's overall affirmative rating will probably enjoy an upsurge. The most recent poll uh, by Sinlinga, which was taken after the State of the Union, says that the president's current standing is 40.4 positive rating on the question of the overall kind of job that the president is doing, which is a considerable jump upwards from his l low rating of October the 20th. I feel that the president's popularity correlates much more exactly and immediately with the state of the economy and the fuel crisis. If the state of the economy improves and if the fuel crisis improves, I think that the esteem of the American people towards him as their leader will solidify and indeed enjoy a resurgence. All right, next call, please. Hello. <clears throat> yes, excuse me. I'd like to uh, talk to uh, Dr. McLaughlin. Uh, yes. Jerry, if I could. Go ahead. 
Uh, I'm a parent. I have three small children, one seven, one four, and one a year and a half. Now the seven-year-old and the four-year-old watch the news and see television and hear Watergate discussed. And I, they ask questions, and yet at the same time, we have the obligation of trying to develop a, a, a moral sensitivity and a conscience with them. And it seems to me that Dr. McLaughlin argues, much as the petulant child argues, that, well, he did it more, uh, I wasn't there, uh, he started it, I, I was just there. Um, and there is that well-known line about the hottest places in, in hell are reserved for those who, in a time of moral crisis, take a position of neutrality, and it seems to me this is exactly the position that Dr. McLaughlin argues. He made one statement, though, at the very beginning of the program, almost as an aside, but really it's an admission. He said, and I think I quote him correctly, but there were mistakes, serious mistakes. I would like Dr. McLaughlin to tell me and others what the mistakes, the serious mistakes, were. Uh, I'm just trying to disentangle some of your rhetoric. Um, with regard to neutrality, I... I'd like to hear what the serious mistakes, Dr. McLaughlin, well, what, that you what, is, uh, what is your earlier point with regard to uh, he did more or he wasn't there, well, I think you're, or well, the hottest listening. places in hell, or yeah. those... Well, no, you, your argument obviously is, and let's, let's, I want to hear some facts, because this is what you uh, could be helpful on. Uh, you, you cited historical precedent as arguing that all presidents, except William Henry Harrison, his 31 days, committed abuses of presidential power. No, you, you talked you're... about the Bobby Baker case and everything else. Now, let's get away from the rhetoric, rhetoric as you suggest, and talk about the mistakes. What mistakes? Actually, you're uh, misconstruing what I what said about mistakes, earlier presidents. What I said was that if you bloat the definition of an impeachable offense earlier discussion, so as to what include the maladministration were. or abuse of presidential power, then you would have to include acts I by every that. president of the that. United States, yes, with the possible exception of Harrison, Let's talk who was in office mistake. for too short a time. Let's talk about what mistake. But I have not taken any position of what? neutrality here. I have firmly defended no, you, you the innocence argue. No, of Richard Nixon right. of any criminal complicity no, in any acts relating to Watergate or in the Watergate aftermath. Now let's talk about the mistakes. What mistakes were made with respect to Watergate by Richard Nixon? Well, this is a complicated question. Well, I think it's very simple. It's four or five words. What mistakes were committed by Richard Nixon with respect to Watergate? The problem that Watergate points to is the problem of the federal bureaucracy. It began with Franklin Roosevelt. Let's know. Let's let's keep it right on the point, Dr. Franklin McLaughlin. Roosevelt what mistakes would you call Dr. Fielding's by office the breaking a mistake? And by the inertia of the federal bureaucracy. Let's talk about Dr. Fielding. And every office. president since that time has been so annoyed. Let's talk about In Dr. Fielding's office. In order to Fielding's deal office. with that bureaucracy, what Let's President talk about Roosevelt Dr. did Fielding's office. is that he appointed a group of special advisors around himself. And I would refer you, Do you want to, talk about to the, the book Houston by plan? Patrick Anderson, The President's Men. Yes, I read that. Do you want to talk about the Houston now, plan? These advisors and subsequent administrations, you want to talk the about the administration, break in? in the Eisenhower administration, and indeed in the current administration, gradually became you want to talk more about and the more illegal numerous firing? and more and more influential. The problem, therefore, of about coping with a large bureaucracy was met with by the creation of a small bureaucracy around the president. Beginning with FDR, continuing through Eisenhower and Kennedy and Johnson and Nixon. But by the time it reached Nixon, it reached such a point that the president, almost of necessity, developed a loose rein. Because there were so many men and the, the process of presidential decision making had become so slack. Now, if you want to challenge, and I, I think most of us should at this time, and I think this is going to be one of the great lessons coming out of Watergate, the whole presidential system let's, in the United no, States. No, let's stick to the point, Dr. And perhaps McLaughlin, develop and get away. fresh let's ideas get back like to the, point, sir. the possibilities the point, of 
developing you've, you've vice a, presidents, multiple vice presidents with executive authority here. so as to keep the bureaucracy what you have more done tightly reined to the president, to the question. then I think this could be done. I answer think this would be a, I think this would be a valid and useful and, and refreshing exercise. Answer the question. I'll give you one what more shot at uh, Father McLaughlin to get him to answer what you want. You, you have not answered the question. I'm asking you what mistakes. I asked you about the fielding break-in, the Houston plan, the break-in at the Watergate, the obstruction of justice and the covering up, his problems, if not criminality, with respect to the taxes, the violations of the criminal law with respect to campaign financing, perjury, obstruction of justice, misuse of governmental funds, all criminal. All criminal. Yes, now, but you you know, these are allegations. Was... and uh, Allegations? What... Shall we discuss uh, which one anyone, of them would you like to discuss? I want you to answer. Would you admit that any one of those are on your... List of well, you take the income tax list. picture of the president. There are those who say that the donations of his presidential paper, vice presidential papers was improper. Now, and the yet, question is not improper. Yet the, the actual transfer took a... place three months before the law went into effect. Yet Theodore Sorensen no, claimed $75,000. You don't even know your facts. You know John facts. You Kenneth Galbraith know. also claimed a deduction. Wait Hubert a Humphrey That's... claimed deductions the every year is, since he, no, from the time the that point, he was mayor of Minneapolis. The point is not whether or not the law the, that, that there ought to be or not ought to be a deduction for, for gifts. The question, really, with respect to Nixon, based on the testimony of the resigned Mr. Morgan, was whether or not there was criminal fraud. I don't think you can conclude from the Mr. fact Morgan, that Ed Morgan, Morgan resigned that there, was a, that there was any improper activity Mr. on the Morgan, part of the president. Mr. There may Morgan, be a he there may be technical violation, return. but nevertheless the he IRS re audited the president's tax returns they once. They did not. You know, there is nothing sinister in so arranging your affairs so as to pay the lowest tax possible. Well, there Everybody is, there does is so, the rich and the poor, there and is. all do right. There is, is something For there is no public sinister. duty to pay more than the law requires. No, but the law requires the law to be followed. The, the law allowed the deduction, but the question, is, sir, the question, Taxes sir, are not voluntary not contributions. They are enforced exactions, and to demand more in the name of morals is can't. Well, you Those know, are the words of just, Justice Learned Hand, it, it and I would recommend me, them to you it, for your considerations. Well, I would also recommend right. to you that you take seriously the, the obligation that we all have of contributing to charity. Richard Nixon has received a great deal of vituperation because his charitable contributions during you know, the time that he Dr. was president are small. You have an amazing what is overlooked is the failing. fact, however, that he, he did not handle his own checking account during the four years that he well, had you been know, president. If, if, you know, the only but prior excuse, to that, from the years 1963 Nixon, sir, to the years 1968, Richard Nixon, Richard Nixon contributed in excess of $56,000 to charities, and I submit to you that that is a sizable figure, and others should do as much. Sir, thank you very much. We'll return to Father McLaughlin here on The Spirit of New England, WBZ Boston, Group W Westinghouse Broadcasting in a moment. Your calls and comments until midnight. There are very few things in this world that are fully guaranteed particularly investments. And that's why Suffolk Franklin's nine-year and two-month saving certificates, which guarantee to double your money, make so much sense. Listen, they pay an effective yield of 7.9% on an annual interest rate of 7.5%. Interest is compounded daily. So these high-interest certificates, worth $1,000 now, will be worth $2,007.67 on maturity. Double your money. And every penny deposited is insured in full. To take advantage of it, just visit any one of Suffolk Franklin's 12 offices. And while you're there, ask about our shorter-term certificates, all of which offer attractive rates. Suffolk Franklin's nine-year and two-month saving certificates. $1,000 minimum, $10,000 maximum. An investment guaranteed to double your money, period. Suffolk Franklin, a mutual saving bank. Member Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation and Deposit Insurance Fund of Massachusetts. Recently, two traffic policemen went on strike by blockading a major highway with their own cars, trapping thousands of hapless commuters for more than eight hours. Hurry up! So it seems that in addition to the approximately 17 million accidents a year, the 23,000 miles of road construction, and the 112 million other vehicles, now you can get stuck behind the people who are supposed to keep you moving. Get them off the road! The Volvo 164 was designed with such madness in mind. Knowing you're destined to spend a great deal of your driving life standing still, we've provided the 164 with massive seats that actually adjust to the needs of your spine. 
with air conditioning for when you are hot, a heated driver's seat for when you are cold, and enough legroom to keep a six-foot, six-inch commuter from crawling out of his skin. What is it? Somebody call a cop! The Volvo 164, a civilized car built for an uncivilized world. Look up your local Volvo dealer in the yellow pages and test drive a Volvo. Friday night is bargain night at Boston's Museum of Science. Admission is half price every Friday night, and you'll get to see a different social program every week. If you'd like more information, BZ suggests you call the museum at 723-2500. Yes, when you say Budweiser. One thing you can't fool American beer drinkers about, and that's taste. When it comes to beer, they know what they like. And so many millions of American beer drinkers prefer and choose the Budweiser taste that it's the largest selling beer in the history of the world. And that's a fact. Pick up a six pack of Bud and taste why. Yes, when you say Bud Weiser, you said it all. Yes. I'm the no-nonsense type, especially in the morning. That's why I like breakfast with John Langone. He writes Medical Beat in the Boston Herald American. Well, Mr. Langone told me something fascinating. In a recent hospital study on elderly patients, wine taken after dinner dramatically increased awareness and reduced the need for tranquilizers. A little wine. Well, it's just one test, but it is interesting. In fact, the Boston Herald American every morning is interesting. Call 426-3000 and have a good breakfast with the Herald American. Let's continue with Father McLaughlin. Hello. Hello. Next call, please. Two five four five six seven eight. Hello. Good evening, Mr. Williams. Yes, speak up, please. Good evening, Mr. Williams. I'm with you, pal. And uh, hello, Mr. Laughlin. Good evening. I uh, have been listening to the program this evening and find it all very stimulating, but then again, mind blowing. You really blow my mind, Mr. Laughlin, and I call you Mr. Laughlin because you don't seem to know what you are. No, it's Mr. Mr. Or. Uh, Doctor, Mr. Doctor, or Father, yeah, whatever you, you know, prefer. All right. Tag is a, a phony uh, thing, anyways. Well, it's uh, Mc, let's get uh, the name right, anyway, so that you'll have the name yes, in your mind. McLaughlin. 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 Right. Yes. Well, you know, you're absolutely incredible, Mr. Laughlin. I really have the feeling that if I were to walk into that studio, I'd see you there with a key in your back. You sound like someone who has been programmed and wound up to go. That's the way you sound to me. That's just the way you come across. And uh, it just disturbs me. It, it really does. It upsets me because I am Catholic. And I want to make this point. I want to uh, impart a bit of information to you before I, I cut this off, Mr. Laughlin. I want you to know and I say this in all reverence, Jesus Christ, Lord of all, is the real master, not Richard Milhouse Nixon. Good evening and thank you. All right, uh, at, at least we have the name straight. It's McLaughlin. And, uh, there's an old political... John McLaughlin. Yeah, the, the, uh, there's a political trick in Massachusetts, by the way. And I didn't catch on to it until about eight or ten years after it was being done, but... Of James Michael Curley, or you no? Know, that this was a, a a trick. One city councilor in kept calling another city councilor by a mispronunciation of his name. Yes. But he, this man was a lawyer, and of course knew much better than that. <laughs> but he kept forever mispronouncing his name, and I think that's a Boston political trick. And I, of course, didn't come awake to it till about eight or ten years later than it was being practiced. But uh, you I know, think that's, Schopenhauer, the pessimist. Uh, would not pay his bills if anyone either misspelt his name or if they mispronounced his I name. I think that's a good idea. Next call. Hello. Yes, hi. I like to support, I'm a supporter of President Nixon. I voted for him in the last election. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I think everybody's trying to make the culpability of the president hinge upon the indictments that have been returned and the people that have pled guilty. First of all, I draw an analogy to the former Speaker of the House of Representatives, John W. McCormick, where two of his immediate aides, most important people in his office, were indicted and found criminally culpable for offenses of range from bribery, bribery to influence, what have you. And I don't see where this makes the Speaker of the House any more guilty than uh, the President is, or any less guilty. And another thing I'd like to enunciate on is uh, in regards to John W. Dean. 
He's the only person and all persons that appeared before the Watergate Committee that actually accused the president of any of the having knowledge of the cover-up or uh, uh, obstruction of justice. And before he went and did this, I should think it should be noted that he went to see that he was securely protected, granted immunity from prosecution. In fact, this is was his, was his, his bag and that he drove that he would not testify until he was granted this immunity. And this is what he was done, limited use, limited use immunity before he ever appeared before that Watergate uh, committee. I think this ought to be there on his credibility. I mean, let's face it, if he, uh, Haldeman, Ehrlichman, none of these other people went mm -hmm. to the prosecutor and said, well, gee, if you give me limited immunity, I'll tell you the whole spill the beans. All right. I think the, poise, uh, the points are well extremely made. well taken, especially the point about... Uh, Speaker McCormick and uh, his embarrassments by his two immediate aides uh, about whose activity he was totally innocent of any knowledge. Yes. Yes. Okay, sir. Well, you have a lot of other calls. We want to get some in before the end of the program. All right? Thank you very much. Next call, please. Hello. Hey, Jerry. Yes. I just want to compliment you very much for putting this gentleman on this evening. And I think uh, you ought to go dig up uh, a lot more of his thinking because I think it uh, would... Uh, show that the, oh, 29, 27, or whatever percentage is, uh, what their mentality is, and I think it's a good thing. And that's, I uh, just want to commend you for... Well, we, 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 uh, everybody got a little knife out throwing, right? No, no, no. Well, that's, it's all right, but no, they're no, on no, both no. sides. No, no, uh, please believe me, this is not knife throwing. I think no, what you're saying is that you're glad to hear somebody whose opinion you necessarily disagree with, because what you'd like to hear, let people hear, is people who have dis disagreeable points of view to you, because right. uh, uh, then m might distribute that opinion uh, to a wide audience. Is that I, what you're saying? I, yes, definitely. All right, I just want to make I, sure that people understand what you're saying. No, I think the, the people have a right to say what their opinions are, and uh, uh, when they can't defend it and they, they won't answer questions of what they say they believe, uh, and they just go on and on repeating the same thing again, which has really no basis in fact from what has been uh, drawn out forward. I think it's a good thing. All right. Father McLaughlin, any comment on that? No. no. Okay. All right. We'll take a short break and return with some final calls and comments until the midnight hour. Ireland is castles and linen and lace. You know you will be touched by the charm of the place. You'll still find a girl. Irish eyes smiling in old Killarney. Dublin's a fair city and you'll love Galway Bay. Come to Ireland and find yourself singing each day. Ireland's like travel used to be when the world was glad to see you. Write the Irish Tourist Board for your free vacation planner, Ireland Personally Yours. Box 1200, Long Island City, New York. Or call Aer Lingus Irish, 617-482-2770. That's 482-2770. Come to Ireland and find yourself singing each Come day. to Ireland and find yourself singing each Come day. Find... Ah, you've set a splendid table, Wellington. Thank you, sir. Ah, filet mignon, stroganoff, and made with Pennsylvania Dutch rich egg noodles, I presume. As always, sir. Oh, delicious. It is most decent of Pennsylvania Dutch to make egg noodles just for the privileged few, Wellington. But, sir, Pennsylvania Dutch egg noodles aren't expensive. They're called the rich egg noodles because they're so rich and gold, and they're made with just the egg yolks, never the whites, and a special blend of enriched durum flour. You mean to say everyone, literally everyone, can enjoy their rich goodness? I'm afraid so, sir. Well, in that case, Wellington, you might as well join me. I've been waiting for you to ask for 17 years, sir. Pennsylvania Dutch also makes a great tasting egg noodles and sauce side dish, Egg Noodles Plus. Tender golden egg noodles plus a mouth-watering cheese, chicken, butter, or beef sauce complete in one envelope. Egg Noodles Plus cooks up in one pot with no draining in just seven minutes. Serve your family a delicious new side dish, Egg Noodles Plus. It's a real plus at lunch or dinner. 
see A Matter of Winning, an exciting new movie of the Grand Prix of snowmobiling. Wilder than anything on wheels, here is the dramatic story of a real snowmobile ace, Gordon Schaefer, battling his way to the racing championships. To him, winning is a way of life. Filmed exactly as it happened, to men tearing across the ice at 70 miles an hour. Movie entertainment for the entire family. A Matter of Winning, rated G. See the most exciting and different racing film ever, A Matter of Winning, starting Wednesday in a theater near you. Take a second now, look up in the sky, can't you see the blue there? That's an eastern plane flying through the sky, shouldn't that be you there? You gotta believe, it's for you. You gotta believe, things come true. You gotta believe it, look it up now. Easterns, look it up now. Look at us, look at you. And you gotta believe you can fly. You can go where you want to go fly. Do what you want to do fly. Be what you want to be Fly Easter. You gotta believe. That, what am I doing? Oh, Eastern Airlines, right, yes. Eastern believes saving you time is good business. That's why Eastern has three non-stops to Tampa, St. Petersburg, one non-stop to nearby Orlando for reservations. Call your travel agent or Eastern, the wings of man. Now, back to the calls. Hello. Hello, Jerry? Yes. Uh, I just want to say something quickly If uh, to Father McLaughlin. If Haldeman is lying, the president is lying, too. Haldeman insisted that the president added when saying how easy it would be to raise a million dollars for hush money, Quote, but that would be wrong. He had heard it both on person and in tape, Haldeman swore. But the Watergate grand jury heard that tape. The conclusion they reached is that the president never said it. And you remember the president at a press conference said that's a, uh, that he agreed wholeheartedly with Haldeman. I'd like your reaction, Father Clark. I'll give you my reaction. Uh, the, the phrase... Uh, but uh, it would be wrong. Change the phrase now. The no, phrase, no, 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 the let's phrase let's but it would be wrong, should be linked more immediately to the clemency request rather than oh to God. the one million dollars. If you read, if you read the testimony, well, an answer, if you, you can... read the testimony of Haldeman and Senator Howard, Senator Howard Baker, you will see that Haldeman at no time links it to. The one million dollar request. He did too. Now I would like to read to you what I don't uh, want to transpired at that hearing. President Nixon agreed with all the By referring to the August twenty second statement of the president, I'd like to read to you that in full because I think that states precisely what happened. And I do think, when all of this is said and done, that even Haldeman will probably be vindicated. Father in the McLaughlin, perjury the Watergate grand jury, listened to the tape. They the know exactly what president said. The question is, Mr. President, could you tell us your Haldeman recollection of what you perjury. told John Dean on March twenty one on the subject of raising funds for the Watergate defendants? The president, certainly. Mr. Haldeman has testified to that, and his statement is accurate. Basically, what Mr. Dean was concerned about on March 21 was not so much the raising of money for the defendants, but the raising of money for the defendants for the purpose of keeping them still. In other words, so-called hush money. The one would be legal, in other words, raising a defense fund for any group, any individual, as you know, is perfectly legal, and it is done all the time. But if you raise funds for the purpose of keeping an individual from talking, that is obstruction of justice. Mr. Dean said also on March 21 that there was an attempt, as he put it, to blackmail the White House, to blackmail the White House by one of the defendants. Incidentally, that defendant has denied it, but at least this was what Mr. Dean had claimed, and that unless certain amounts of money were paid, I think it was $120,000 for attorney's fees and other support, that this particular defendant would make a statement, not with regard to Watergate, but with regard to some other national security matter in which Mr. Ehrlichman had particular responsibility. My reaction very briefly was this. I said, as you look at this, I said, isn't it quite obvious first that it is going to have, it is, that if it's going to have any chance to succeed, that these individuals aren't going to sit there in jail for four years, they are going to have clemency. Isn't that correct? He said, yes. I said, we can't give clemency. He agreed. Then I went on to another point. I said, the second point is that isn't it also quite obvious, as far as this is concerned, that while we could raise the money, and he indicated in answer to my question it would probably take a million dollars over four years to take care of this defendant and others on this kind of basis, the problem was how do you get the money to them and also how do you get around the problem of clemency because they are not 
going to stay in jail simply because their families are being taken care of. And so that was, what I, that was why I concluded, as Mr. Haldeman recalls, perhaps, and did testify very effectively, one, when I said, John, it is wrong, it won't work, we can't give clemency, and we have to get, we have got to get this story out. And therefore, I direct you, and I direct Haldeman, and I direct Ehrlichman, and I direct Mitchell to get together tomorrow and then meet with me as to how we get this story out. And, and that is how the meeting on the 22nd took okay, place. I'm, End I'm of quote. I'm going to speak directly to the meeting because Haldeman then went out and paid $75,000 to Hunt, and the next day Mitchell said, now Hunt will be quiet. No, you're That's inaccurate. In you're that you're inaccurate on I'm that point. I'm reading directly from the indictment. No, you're not reading from the indictment because the indictment says that about 12.30 p.m. Haldeman and Mitchell had a telephone conversation. Now, the indictment, su that the indictment suggests that that telephone that conversation meeting? involved Mr. Haldeman requesting Mr. Mitchell to contribute uh, money. But Mr. Haldeman has already accounted for that conversation differently. Mr. Haldeman has said that he called Mr. Mitchell and told him to come immediately to Washington because the president wanted to talk to him. The so what you have here, what you have here is McLaughlin circumstantial evidence plus never said the that. implication that because, uh, because Mr. Haldeman... Uh, is construed to have linked, but it would be wrong, to the $1 million, and technically the tape perhaps does not support that. Nevertheless, the president did say, but it would be wrong in connection with clemency, and that contextually is linked back to the $1 million, and therefore substantively supports the broad point of Mr. Haldeman, I think you'll find Is that, A, he's Watergate not guilty defense? of perjury, and B, the president will be seen to have rejected any kind of a unlawful option that may have been presented to him I'm in the course of a very freewheeling conversation. I'm surprised the White House didn't mutilate that tape, too. I would like to say in the few moments that remain for those who haven't had a chance to call me this morning that I will be appearing on a television show tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, channel WCVB-TV, and also in a live interview at 10.30 on WKBG-TV, and also in the evening on WGBH-TV at 6.30 p.m. We have about uh, three minutes, uh, Father McLaughlin, so anything you'd like to say in the three minutes is yours. Well, I would like to see the, uh, the Rodino Committee, the House Judiciary Committee, first of all, come forward with a definition of what is an impeachable act. Then I would like to see it move expeditiously and come to a vote on this question of such serious moment. Clearly it is in the interest of this country and in the interest of the international community to have a unified United States behind a leader who is recognized by the American people to be their leader for the next uh, three years, the balance of this term. And the sooner that we can put this matter behind us, the better. Uh, I would not want anyone to construe for my appearance here this evening that I want anything else but full legal process to take place. But what I am in, in, insistent upon, and I think we all should be insistent upon, that this process not become politicized. That is, that it not become a contest of political strength between two warring factions, but rather that the innocence or guilt of Richard Nixon with regard to some impeachable offense, one that would entail criminality, be held sharply in focus, because if that is done, then I am convinced that Richard Nixon, his innocence will appear, and that he will be allowed to continue his uh, fulfilling his mandate, the greatest popular mandate in the history of this country. My thanks again to Dr. John McLaughlin, Deputy Special Assistant to the President of the United States, has been with the President for about three years now, ran for uh, United States Senate seat from Rhode Island in 1970. Thank you for spending a good long period of time with us and for taking on uh, many people who have opposing points of view. This is Jerry Williams. Stand by. These are times like none we've known And sometimes you feel alone Trying hard to stretch each dollar Squeezing nickels till they holler And you need a bank to give a helping hand Understand what you want when you want it. Why not see one of the ten Shawmut Association banks, like Community National, from Waltham and Newton to Framingham and Marlboro? For the kind of life you lead, you want a bank that fills each need with a lot of strength behind it. Well, there's one place you can find it with the Shawmut Association Bank. You're set. You can get what you want when you want it, what you want when you want it, what you want. Cheese made by Norman's a great variety. It's not just for sandwiches, what for 
versatility You'll find the cheese of your life made the old country way Cheese made by Dorman's, Dorman's pure grade A It's a natural cheese, there ain't nothing artificial Cheese made by Dorman's, Dorman's and the goat cheese well, there's one name to remember for quality cheeses of every description, Dorman's. You'll find Dorman's sliced and chunk cheese at stores all over town. Dorman's Great A Swiss, Munster, Austrian Swiss, Danish Port Salute, Iceland chunks, and many more. They're all natural cheeses made the old country way with no processing, no flavoring, no artificial additives, so go ahead and try some delicious cheese with paper between the slices. From Dorman's, the name to remember. Uh, now, tomorrow night, I guess we're on sort of late, about 11 o'clock or thereabouts, and... Uh, I'm not quite sure what, what game there is. I don't think we're on Wednesday night at all. There are two games, one after the other on Wednesday night, so we won't be on Wednesday, but we will be back on Thursday and Friday as well. We have some interesting guests lined up. Uh, one, of, one of the guests um, that is going to uh, return uh, to the program is the um, uh, spiritual psychic we had on a couple of weeks ago from central Massachusetts, from Northfield, Massachusetts, who... Uh, was so interesting and exciting having on the program, and he's going to be back sometime at the end of the month, I think it's the fourth Monday in March, uh, to uh, talk to people. That night we simply did a program without people uh, because we had such an interesting program going right here in the studio, and he has consented to do it again at that time uh, so that we may uh, give a, an opportunity to people to call in all during the night. So we'll have that going for us as well. I thank you very much for being with us again tomorrow night sometime... Um, after the 11 o'clock hour, what, what kind of a game is there? 10.45 is the time. That means there's a Bruins game, right? So right after the Bruins game, we'll be here. It'll be about 10.45 here on WBZ. This is Jerry Williams. Thank you very much, and uh, good night. Good luck, good morning, good night. Why would a multi-million dollar company headquartered in New York come all the way to Needham Heights for its sophisticated four and five color printing needs? Simple. Von Graff is one of the biggest and best printers in the Northeast. Imagine, right in your own backyard in Needham Heights, Congraff, Consolidated Graphics Corporation. Making you look good is what we do best. Hi, this is Larry Glick, and I'll be seeing you right after the news on Radio 103. The Spirit of New England, WBZ Boston, Group W, Westinghouse Broadcasting. It's an incredibly mild 60 degrees here in Boston. Tonight's low will be in the 50s. I'm Ted Larson reporting the 12 o'clock WBZ News. A veritable swirl of news accompanied the return of Secretary of State Henry Kissinger to Washington Monday night from his latest Middle East trip. First, informed sources say the Arab oil embargo against the United States will come to an end next week. The sources say the oil will be turned on to pre-embargo levels and the price will go down from the present over $11 a barrel to around 7 The reports also say the Arab oil producing nations will resume production equal to levels reached before the October war. The decision to end the embargo will supposedly may be made this Sunday when the Arab oil ministers meet in Syria. The second story to surround Kissinger's return concerns a plot to kill the secretary when he was in Syria last week for peace talks with President Hafez Assad. The State Department said a group of terrorists, probably Arabs, were going to kill Kissinger when he...